Um, I'd actually I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, uh, a number of people uh, for inviting an Easterner to come here to Vancouver and yet be one another Easterner telling the West its business. I promise not to do that this morning. I'd like to thank Peter Meehan, uh, the principal and the president, uh, who invited me uh, several months ago. And I must make a confession, much like Bob Anderson does in the Insiders on the CBC, when he said, well, before I say anything, I have to admit that my brother is working for the Conservative Party and my daughter is working for the Liberal Party. I have to make a confession to you. It's my apologia pro vita sua at this point, and that is, is that um, Peter and I have a, have a long history together. Uh, in fact, uh, believe it or not, despite his gray hair and my auburn hair, I actually helped supervise his dissertation uh, at the <laughs> University of Toronto. And I can assure you, given the quality of his academic work and of his character, you have made a very wise and visionary selection in making Peter Meehan the pre principal and the president of your colleges. <laughs> I'd like to also thank someone who isn't here with us physically, but is here in spirit, and that is Father Henry Carr. And as uh, the Archbishop uh, mentioned in his opening remarks, I mean, it was the Bazillion Fathers and the vision of Henry Carr, a native of Oshawa, Ontario, who believed in the vitality of Catholic institutions being implanted in the great universities of our country. I mean, it was a vision that he had knowing full well that the Catholic community then and even now was a community that was small outside of Quebec. And because that community was small, its message out, it was heart. It was a community that could get its message out. It could honor its tradition by doing so in partnership with larger institutions that often had a greater degree uh, of financial largesse than what the Catholic community did. And what he did at St. Michael's College in 1910 was created this unique idea in Canada of the Federation. In this case, between St. Michael's College and the University of Toronto. And the rest is history there, and I'm boasting about my own institutions, but that's not unusual if you come from the East. But that also planted the seeds for places like St. Joseph's College at the University of Alberta, St. Thomas More College at the University of Saskatchewan, the Jesuits and St. Paul's College at the University of Manitoba, and then Carr came here himself. And I could say, you are the people standing now on the shoulders of giants like Henry Carr from Oshawa, Ontario, making sure that the Catholic tradition was embedded in all its vitality in one of the great educational institutions of this country, and that is the University of British Columbia. And so I thank Henry Carr posthumously because I know his spirit is with us here today in full knowledge of the mission that we have. So uh, those are, are a few uh, of my thanks. My thanks to some of the people I've met as well. Um, I feel very much at home here. Um, I'm, I'm a rambling Ontarian. I come from the Ottawa Valley where we uh, speak neither official language but quickly. Uh, so uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're having problems understanding me, it's, it's, it's just my, my, my cultural baggage this morning, okay? Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, I've met a number of historical colleagues here and, and I think Vancouver is blessed to become uh, really the, uh, the retirement place uh, or uh, the, the, the place of great activity of continuing scholars like uh, Jackie Gresco, who is here uh, today, who many of you know, uh, Dick Lebrun, formerly of Manitoba, who is here as well. It's, it's, it's great to see historical colleagues here. So on with, on with the little chat. Normally what you get, I think, from many people, and quite rightly, is when you were talking about the Catholic University and its future, either in Canada uh, or in the world, you would often allude uh, to Cardinal Newman. I'm not going to do that this morning, not because Newman's not worth talking about, but it's because I think we're at one of those axial moments in our history as Catholics, both Pope is saying to us, to take a look perhaps at what the current Pope is saying to us, okay, 
and potentially guiding us with regard to our mission as Catholic educators, not necessarily just in Canada, but I think right here in Vancouver at your institution. So one of the things I'm going to do is if I, I become terribly boring over the next few minutes, you'll at least have some pictures to look at and uh, it'll give me the semblance that um, I'll get out of here alive within a half an hour uh, with some friends. Certainly the, the advent of, of uh, of Francis as Pope has certainly rattled many people in the world. It's rattled a number of Catholics because of his very manner and his very personhood. It's, it's also garnered a lot of attention from the non-Catholic community in a, in a way that I found very similar to uh, the emergence of Pope John, to now St. John Paul II, in the late 70s. Um, it's not necessarily, my friends, that, that the message has changed. It's really the way in which the message has been prioritized and delivered that has changed. John Paul II came out of the blocks running as the first non-Italian pope in, in over four centuries. Um, he had a, 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 a dramatic flair to him. He had a dynamism. He spoke from his heart, from his mind, and he traveled. He was present to people. People paid attention. And I think the same thing is happening now with, with what has now become called the Francis effect. And I think when you analyze the things that he's written, the things that he said, I think what I've done for you this morning is I've pulled four things out that may be usable within our Catholic communities across Canada, particularly with regard to higher education, that might be able to bring that Francis effect quite meaningfully into our own context. So there are four things. I, I had a, a, a great uncle who was a Presbyterian minister who always said, Mark, always keep it to three things, okay? Three points in the sermon, three points in the hobbling. I'm going to give you four because I'm really going to test your patience this morning with four. And it'll also give you those who really find me obnoxious and boring that countdown. Oh gosh, he's now on number three. We're almost done, okay? But I think one of the things that to preface the four with is that Francis brings to us a new attitude. And before I, I even talk about the substance, we, we look at what he's done just in terms of being who he is. The whole process of his election was different. Remembering that the first, I have a picture here of him paying his, his hotel bill. But remembering that the first things he says is that when he was elected Pope, his fellow Latin American, Cardinal Humes from Brazil, said to him, remember the poor. And that stuck with him. In his choice of a name, quite clearly emulating Francis of Assisi, and that's a whole lecture in and of itself, looking between the two Francises. Um, referring to himself not as Pope, but as you have searched a long way to find a new Bishop of Rome. There's a new attitude here, paying his car, uh, washing the feet of those in a prison in Rome uh, during uh, the first stage of the Holy Triduum in his first year as Pope, not, short, not long after he was elected, embracing a deformed man during one of his public appearances quite early in his pontificate, just adjusting the mic here, letting a child occupy his chair. Can you imagine how apoplectic we would be? You know, you organize a big event, something like this, and one of the most important people in the world is going to be there in the chair, and suddenly a little kid from the audience runs up. It would be like somebody running up and standing on the stage here, but I'm not in the same league as Francis. He just welcomed him, sat him in the chair. Different attitude. And I think in his first principal uh, address, uh, to not only the church, but anyone who is willing to read, is that there was going to be uh, something different about this pontificate, and something different that means that we have to, in some way, emulate his attitude. He really brings this to the fore in the joy of the gospel, where he says, we have to be a church of mercy. In fact, his own motto emulates that call to mercy. When he's asked by Civilta Cattolica in one of his first interviews, uh, 
and they, they say, well, who are you really? And he says, I am a sinner saved by the mercy of God. That's how he identified himself. And so he's putting out a general call for a merciful church. And also a church that looks and feels and demonstrates joy. I love some of his, his commentary with regard to that. Catholics walk around like it's always Lent. Where's the Easter? You know? He says our parishes have often been unwelcoming. He's a joyful people attract. Confessional. What does it always look like someone's been beaten up in the confessional? The long faces. We, if we're going to be truly attractive, given the power of the message that we have, we should look joyful. Christ preaches joy. We as Christians should be joyful. And so before you get to any of the four points, you realize he's saying, it doesn't matter. After what I've said or what I've written, if you don't demonstrate mercy and joy, you've missed part of the message. We have to put on a new attitude. And that helps build the communication. So, with this in mind, new attitude. Don't look your hearts to the joy of Christ. Now, if you walk out of here with anything today, I would say that might be a quotation worth carrying with you. And I'm going to read it again. When you live the gospel, don't look like you've come back from a funeral. Open your hearts to the joy of Christ. And from that, the other things will flow. Number one, we're going to get to number one. Remember the poor. The graphic here is actually Bridget O'Donnell. Uh, she was a woman who, uh, with her starving children, uh, during the Irish famine of the 1840s, was immortalized uh, in bronze. This is outside of the workhouse at Roscommon in, in, uh, in Roscommon town in Ireland. I'm also a famine scholar, so you'll see some Irish photos here. So if any of our Irish ex uh, of extraction, uh, there's something here for you this morning as well. He says, based on what he had heard from Humez and his own work in Buenos Aires, remember the poor. Almost without being aware of it, we are incapable of feeling compassion for the poor, weeping for other people's pain, or feeling the need to help them. And what he says clearly in the joy of the gospel is the church that he envisions is a church for the poor and who is poor. And I think that's a message that we have to, to take very seriously. What he's, what he's saying is, I want to dirty, and that has been on the streets. A church that's prepared to roll up its sleeves, be poor, and work with the poor. And this message has resonated throughout the joy of the gospel. It's a message that also permeates Laudato his encyclical on the environment, which was released in the late spring. And it's permeated. He said, the church cannot remain on the sidelines in the call for justice. And he warns, some Catholics are afraid to witness justice because they fear falling into error. Now, just in case you think I'm making this up as I go along, which my students do accuse me of at some point, I have put the references to the document right there. So, Evangelii Gaudium, paragraph numbers, just in case you were wondering who this heretic is and you get home and you want to make sure that he's saying uh, what he actually said. Now, that being the case, he took this message quite robustly uh, to... I'm going to move this to my tie. Ooh. The voice of Darth Vader. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that, that's much better, and I'm not having to bend my, my neck. That he, he has uh, demonstrated to the poor, or for the poor, I mean, comes quite concretely. His first visit as Pope was actually to Lampedusa Island in the Mediterranean, 
where his first mass was over an overturned boat that had been used by refugees fleeing to that island, and his chalice was carved from the wood of another boat that had been ruined and where lives had been lost. And it's within this context that he demonstrates through his very person what he means by a church that's willing to be poor and serving the poor. That Jesus was poor. That Jesus had a special affinity to the poor. And that we as Catholic Christians, deeply embedded, constituent within our own teachings, is a preferential option for the poor. And it's funny, he was asked, you know, what he would do when confronted with opposition from Catholics in the United States to what one Catholic congressman considered to be socialism. And on the plane moving towards Washington, D.C., he said to the reporter, I'm not preaching socialism or capitalism. I'm preaching the social doctrine of the church. There's nothing new here. So what does that mean to the university? Well, it means just. To be just, pay just way, human dignity, to serve the common good. And I think it's absolutely essential for a Catholic university in the 21st century to embrace the Pope's call for the poor. And in reviewing what you're doing at Corpus Christi in particular, you now have a program in social justice of Catholic youth and others so that we become nurseries of a generation of Catholic youth and others who have taken to heart the social doctrine of the church. And I think it's absolutely important that within the university setting we do this in a scholarly way and we do it with witnessing in mind. Experiential learning that takes us not only, you know, from the classroom into the greater university community, but takes those teachings be applied in the community at large. If there is a role for the Catholic city in the 21st century, that role is to model the justice that's called for by our own social teaching and by the dynamic witness provided to us by Pope Francis. And I think you have placed yourselves quite uniquely in this situation at Corpus Christi St. Mark's with this program. I think it's worth building. I think it's a program that will really epitomize what a Catholic university should be in the 21st century. A leaven to the world around it, committed to fight the good fight on behalf of the poor. If you're counting, we're now number two. The church must take risks. This is one of the things that was modeled to us by Henry Carr. Uh, his model of taking risks uh, was quite clear, going to what he considered to be territory where perhaps the Catholic faith was in a minority situation. In fact, at some points uh, facing a hostile minority. But Henry Carr wasn't afraid to take a risk to come here, and the Pope engages everyone in this church that this has to be a church that takes risks, is prepared to walk the walk despite the adversity that might be felt as you do it. Look at the risks that taken coming out of his comfort zone. When you read his interview with Bill Talk, when he talks about the church as a field hospital, what is his vision? This church is a field hospital that sets itself up where the thick of the action is in society and helps people and treats people and their immediate needs. He said sometimes there's been a white noise by, by some Catholic teaching that tends to overshadow that we have to be merciful and address the immediate needs. He's already overhauled the Vatican Bank. He's created that group of eight cardinals to re-examine the way in which the church runs. He's emulated the, the missions of both previous popes, John XXIII and John Paul II. He's created new cardinals from across the planet, showing that this church is truly universal, truly global. He's taking risks. There was Bishop Bling, of course, in the Diocese of Lemberg in Germany, that's not the church of the poor, and he immediately went, 
that went to, to VAT to make sure modeled a gospel of the poor and, of course, New Zealand. Now, what does it mean to us? I think one of the biggest challenges to a Catholic college is that challenge of doing what Henry Carr did so well, and that was keep his feet in both worlds, in the Catholic world and in the world around the Catholic world, which the Catholic world permeates. It's not an us or them or an either or situation. It wasn't for Henry Carr, and it shouldn't be for the Catholic college. It's the signs of the times and reads them in a way that they form a Catholic education that addresses things that are relevant, things that are needed, and ways in which the, the tradition can be transmitted. The of Marshall McLuhan. At St. Mike's in 2002, I created a program called Book and Media Studies. And one of the members of our, our Board of Governors said, well, what's Catholic about that? And I said, well, Mark Lewin was one of our great professors in the past. I don't think there's anyone who knows anything about media in this country or internationally that doesn't know the name McLuhan. He was a convert to Roman Catholicism and his very essential message, and that is the medium is the message, was rooted deeply in his Catholicism. That idea was inspired by Jesus Christ. Incarnate, he was the medium that was the message. And McLuhan's Catholicism permeated practically every level of his understanding of what it was to be media literate. And I think this is a powerful message for the Catholic University today. One of my colleagues, Jesuit John Pungenti, I asked to teach a course in the program called Religion and Media. We took risks. No one believed that this program could be remotely successful. We started with 19 minor program students. We now have over 400 and close to 2,000 registrants, just a little over. I read you what he, what he, what. Why did John Pugenti agree to teach in this program? I just want to read you what he, what he, what he said. He said, three statements made an important, uh, helped me make an important decision in the way I developed my course. The first was from Bart Simpson, who once told his father Homer on The Simpsons, quote, it's hard not to listen to TV. It spent so much more time raising me than you have, end quote. <laughs> Secondly, or he said, he said, there was some time when people received their values, their spirituality, their religious beliefs from their home, their church, and their school. Somewhere in the 1960s, a new source of value, spirituality, and religion appeared, the mass media, and has over the years, in some instances, replaced the other value givers. The second reason was a concluding remark made by the eminent British media educator and author Len Masterman, who said, the media are now arguably our culture's primary symbolic system. They will certainly be so through the 20th century and the 21st. Those who do not understand how the media works, how it constructs its meanings, how these meanings can be used, and how evidence they present can be weighed and evaluated in contemporary culture are considerably disadvantaged and disempowered. Finally, John said, the third was Marshall McLuhan's belief that the major causes of change in cultures and civilizations are not ideologies, wars, or religions, but rather new communications technologies which structure society. When a new communications technology is created, society finds itself restructured by it. Information technology is responsible for dra dramatically changing cultures and affecting every issue of social values. And so I would respond to the person who said to me, What's so Catholic about studying the media? My response is, it's something that we've done historically from the very beginning, and it's something that we must do now, urgently, in order to understand, one, what the media is, how it transmits these values, 
how we can be literate in what the media does, and then how we can be creative in news media. McLuhan was really quite provocative when he said, 79, how do you preach an incarnate God in a disincarnate world? Let's look, you live now in a disincarnate world. Everybody, let's look at those things in front of them. Some of you have them under the table right now, I know, too. Yeah, yeah. We are a screen culture. We are a culture of virtual reality. We are a culture of cyberspace. How well do we understand that culture? How well are we using it? I once addressed the Ontario bishops. We were talking, a, a, a Presbyterian professor from Knox College and I were talking about the state of religion in Ontario. And I, I said to the bishops, do you know what the kids in Catholic schools are watching? And I showed them a clip of South Park. And the South Park clip on priestly abuse. Well, some of them still haven't talked to me. But one of them said, South Park said, this is very powerful and I don't know how we can, we can address this. And I said, media literacy having students understand how to question and how to evaluate media. And by the way, you have a new program at Corpus Christi, St. Mark's now, that hopefully will do just that. I think that's a great investment in higher Catholic education, is to invest in a greater course of study in media literacy. Because if we don't, we will quickly be left sidelines in addressing the key issues, the social issues, the political issues, the economic issues, the moral issues of our society and of generations to come. Number three, if you're counting. Our common home. Certainly alluded to in Evangelium Gaudium is the problem of the planet, the problem of climate change, the problem of what Francis would term the misuse of our environment. He said, in this world, we have formalized indifference. Watch over and protect the fragile world in which we live. And what he has done is he actually links this point to my first point, his first point, and that is the poor that the environmental degradation that we note today has a spillover effect on the poorest of the poor in the world tomorrow, that both issues are linked, that now is the time, as he says in his encyclical, to take the environment seriously, that we have seriously degraded the planet. This is a very important quotation, and it comes from They become self-centered, self-interested, their greed increases. The emptier a person's heart is, the more he or she needs things to buy, to own, and consume. It is almost impossible to accept the limits imposed by reality in this horizon. A general sense of the common good also disappears. What he points out is that, in many ways, our attitude towards the environment is an attitude that requires a change of heart. A change of heart that not looks within to ourselves, but looks to others. And when looking to others, serving the common good. And so how can the academy contribute to this? How can the academy be a meaningful conduit whereby we can look at Laudato Si and the cry of the joy of the gospel for greater attention to the environment. And I would say, as an educator, the best way in which we can do that is, given our tradition in the humanities, in the universities, to now engage fully in dialogue with the sciences. In fact, at the latter part of, of his letter, Francis says, he mentions four new things that he wants to think about. One of these four things is unity is greater than the parts. 
Now, he leaves these ideas undeveloped. But one of the things that he talks about in that is that Catholics are going to have to dialogue with others to create some common solutions. We have gifts to bring to the, to the conversation. And we bring those gifts and others bring them, those gifts and we may come up with good solutions. And one of the things, as a former scientist, as a chemist, he says, we have to dialogue more with science. And the question of the environment and climate change I think this comes to home, this homes to roost, really. That in our academy, we have the ideal situation wherein we can bring the great tradition to dialogue with science and to create solutions to some of the most pressing environmental problems of the day with the moral backing that our great tradition gives it enough, those people, and it's been acknowledged, are often more willing to engage in this, part, in this, in this endeavor than those people of science. Chris Christie, St. Mark's, you are at a point now with your new program in Science and the Environment that you're going to be an important step in this direction, honoring the Pope's intention that Catholics have environmental issues of the day much more effectively. And that's a good job for Catholic higher education, bringing together experts in the humanities, in religion, philosophy, and science to come to common resolutions to problems that affect us all. Number three. So right again, number one, remember the poor. Number two, take those risks. Number three, our common home. Finally, and your thanks be to God, Deo gratias, he's almost done. What our Catholic institutions as Catholics should be doing is creating servants that lead and leaders that serve. Throughout all of the previous three things, if we fail to create young men and women or nurture young men take their knowledge in the academy, outside of the academy, to serve as leaders, then we fall in short of the high benchmarks in higher Catholic education. Francis says, an authentic faith which is never comfortable always involves a deep desire to change the world, to transmit values, to leave the earth a better place than when we found it. He's making that challenge to us and particularly our young people to look at the key values of our faith, study them, and then just don't leave them in the class outside the door. Be the church in your community. Be, as St. Rose of Lima would say, the arms and the legs of Christ in the world. Be Eucharist in the world. Be the body of Christ in the world. You can talk the talk, but what we must do in our academy, and you've shown programs, that we can also walk the talk as well. Wrong button. As ideas are greater than realities. This quotation really gives me cause to, to, to pause and to ponder. He said, sadly, even with many so solid doctrinal and spiritual convictions seeking power and human glory rather than the good of others, don't let this happen to you. Use that knowledge. Instructors, when you teach, impart that this knowledge is to be used for the greater good of humanity, to serve the gospel every day where you are. Most recently, when he was at El Cobre in Cuba, the Pope was at the, the shrine of Our Lady of Charity, and he reflected on Mary and the role of Mary in the church and one of those roles was the role of 
I would say, la vie voyageur, the, the life of the voyaging virgin. And he said, one of the things about Mary that we can emulate in being leaders in the world is the way in which he moved. And he reflected on the Annunciation. And I'd like to read it to you because I think it's a profound reflection on Mary and how applicable Mary is to us as Catholics today. He says, whenever we look to Mary, we come to believe once again in the revolutionary nature of love and tenderness. We are asked to live the revolution of tenderness as Mary, our mother of charity, did. We are invited to leave home and to open our eyes and ears and hearts to others. Our revolution comes through tenderness, through the joy, which always is closeness and compassion, and leads us to get involved in and to serve in the life of others. Our faith calls us out of the house to visit the sick, the prisoner, and those who mourn. It makes us able to laugh with those who laugh and rejoice with those who rejoice. Like Mary, we want to be a church who serves, who leaves home and goes forth, who goes forth from her chapels, her sacristies, in order to accompany life, to sustain hope, to be a sign of unity. And like Mary, mother of charity, we want to be a church who goes forth to build bridges, to break down walls, to sow seeds of reconciliation. Like Mary, we want to be a church who can accompany all those pregnant situations of our people, committed to life, to culture, to society, not washing our hands, but rather walking with our brothers and sisters, all together, serving, helping. That's the message of being a people who instill within our youth that idea of being servants wherever you are in life who can lead in their own way. And secondly, creating leaders who are not those uh, that we often see demonstrate the skills of leadership and power and self-aggrandization, but those leaders who are truly there to serve. I'm confident that in this community and in these colleges, what I've seen from afar, and as a non-biased witness from afar, but one who is kindred to you in those values, is that here at St. Mark's and at Corpus Christi, you are building solid foundations. You have planted seeds that now need to be nurtured. Those seeds in social justice, those seeds in communication, those seeds in study environmental science, and those seeds planted for future leadership. You are doing something extraordinarily important for the church, and you're doing it in difficult times. Be of courage, because your mission is well worth that. Your mission is well worth uh, all of your efforts, and certainly will become, for a, an example to others, uh, in their, your community and in the Catholic community of Canada. Um, I'm going to end it there, but I would like to thank you for your support of the college today, and I would encourage you to continue your support of the college and to the high ideals for which it stands. Thank you.